Um, since we've gone 10 seconds with no one walking into the room, we're just going to go ahead and start. Um, this is one of these uh, how people use Spinnaker, why uh, customer journey uh, talks. And so my name is Avram. I'm at Scopely, which is a, uh, a mobile games publisher and developer. We make a number of games. We have six things live now, six, seven maybe. Um, some of them are more or less actively developed, a couple million daily users. Um, we have a lot of things actively in development as well. Um, and so all told, it's eight different development studios around the world. I actually didn't count. Um, it's probably like around eight and around six countries. Um, that uh, is sort of a testament to, I think, the, the model as a publisher is that we have a, a lot riding on, on how games work. But um, while there are some central technical services and some technologies that run centrally at Scopely, um, a lot of what happens and a lot of the things that make a game succeed or not, from a technology standpoint, are done uh, independently by different studios. Um, uh, relevant for today's discussion, we are all on AWS and have been since the beginning. I've been there for about five and a half years, um, and uh, Scopely's been on AWS that whole time. We started, uh, we switched over that little workload that was on Azure for a couple of weeks um, onto AWS in early 2012, around when I joined. Um, we're going to talk really about two different stories of adopting Spinnaker, um, and uh, they're very different. Um, one of them that they correspond really to the two areas of engineering and technical investment at the company. Um, on the one hand is the publishing platform group. I'm personally head of engineering publishing platform at Scopely, so that's uh, where um, I work directly. Um, and we adopted Spinnaker first, and we'll talk about that. Um, but the other story is actually Spinnaker as part of the game development process and the rollout that we've, uh, that we've gone through uh, of Spinnaker for game backends. Um, on the publishing side, uh, this is a, it's a team, it's a number of teams that is uh, responsible for uh, a num basically anything that Scopely decides as a company, we want to have done centrally all in one place. So uh, data systems, uh, first among those, uh, things for ad mediation, user acquisition, marketing optimization. Um, it's not eight engineers. Eight engineers who are involved in this in more of a, it's more than eight. It's like 15. I don't know why I wrote eight um, in retrospect. Um, with around 20 live services. Uh, and these are fairly standard job, can handle those Java 8 services running on Linux for a long time. Um, we'll talk about their details, their history, um, mainly, mainly Java 8, a little bit of Node. The game studios are very different from one another. We're mainly going to talk about the story of one game studio um, that is on Spinnaker today, or do on Spinnaker today. Um, importantly, though, uh, as a publisher, uh, we really value that game teams get to focus on making a great game, and we are need to find the right amount of structure and the right amount of centralization that means that they're not that doesn't make the small central team of Scopely a bottleneck for teams that are just trying to figure out how to make a game good. Um, and so what that means is that the games tend to have very different backends. They're uh, and a very different sort of philosophy around how they're building things, and end up with uh, so we have a number of different languages, different deployment patterns across the studios. Um, for a long time, Scopely has been has said that we have uh, certain opinions about how uh, software should be delivered. Um, our, at the time, our, our director of cloud operations, Mitch Garnot, um, uh, gave a talk three years ago already at reInvent uh, about uh, our continuous deployment pipeline um, and how we were doing blue-green deploys for game servers. Um, and uh, we've had we have certain expectations around what we think is a requirement to safely make games. Um, but, and so that meant that we've had uh, something for canary, uh, manual canarying for a long time, and we've had the expectation that game teams will go into production with a strong blue-green deploy. Um, we ended up calling it blue-green because we didn't use Asgard. Um, and, uh, but that was a problem because uh, on AWS, uh, there actually aren't, you, you know, everyone would agree that a, you speak with any, you speak with your TAMs and AWS. Everyone would agree that the right way to deploy um, is uh, a high volume service is a blue green deploy. The right way to do it is to do it by a, uh, adding instances to existing load balancers so you don't have cold load balancers. And because DNS is uh, is finicky, 
Um, therefore, but there were no tools to do so. And so you could do it, but there none of the built-in tools would do it. Um, so there's a prehistory where we've for a long time been, I guess, aligned philosophically, philosophically with, um, with Spinnaker as being the sort of way to do things. Uh, and so we looked at Asgard in 2014 and didn't use it um, and ended up building out a tool called Fleet Commander, which I'm not going to go into any detail on, but it was some Python uh, using Bodo uh, to use combined cloud formation and it's a programmatic using cloud formation in a way that let us do the uh, the we'll talk see some pictures of it, but the uh, new low balance new auto scaling group on existing load balance or model of blue green deployment. Um, but what happened is that as we looked at other studios, as other studios started to mature, other games started to be made by studios that were not uh, just part of Scopely's central team. Uh, we would have these conversations where we say, well, you should have blue green deploy. And they say, great, how? And we say, well, build something. And like, well, we, we're, we don't build deployment tools. We build games. Um, and, you know, and so what, we end, what happened in 2016, uh, Spinnaker already existed, um, is we looked at it and decided, no, 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 no. That this team, we do not want them to now have Cassandra in their infrastructure um, to run Spinnaker, uh, this thing that we've never tried. Um, and we just went ahead and had them use our internal tool. We didn't like this because the problem is that we uh, we don't have a central operations group for all shared across all game studios, so like one person and the CTO. Um, and that one person mainly focused on cost optimization. So we really we didn't want to have a centrally supported suite of tools that we were going to um, that we would be on the hook for making work. That said, for this one case, we did go ahead and they moved on to Fleet Commander, our internal tool. Um, 2017, we actually started working with Armory, actually, on really using Spinnaker, uh, motivated by a couple of things. We'll talk about motivations for individual directions. Um, but we went, uh, the publishing group was in full production at some day in March, I don't remember what day. Um, and the uh, one of the game studios uh, moved on shortly thereafter. So we'll talk about game studios a little bit more. That's in this in the end. I want to go into more detail on how we're using Spinnaker on the publishing platform side. Um, the reason that we wanted to use it um, was that we had been we had an approach for deployment previously, which was that uh, we would use uh, we would use Packer to make an army, and then we would just specify that in the launch configuration in uh, in a, in a would, every service was fully defined in CloudFormation. You would we point to the new army and the new version in CloudFormation. CloudFormation would manage the rollout. Um, which worked if you don't have care at all about the uh, strategy with which you're rolling out your code. Um, CloudFormation, I think maybe it's changed at the time. It basically supported a couple of small parameters around um, a rolling deploy um, without a very clean rollback. And so a rollback with CloudFormation is always kind of scary because something with CloudFormation also has this, you know, this data you can get into where you have to call support and to get it back out of the state. Um, and we didn't have a lot of uh, fine grain control over how we would deploy, which we were okay with all of this, except for two, two real critical things um, that we cared about in publishing at that time. One, we wanted to move to Kubernetes. We wanted to move some of our services to Kubernetes for uh, speed of deployment and better bin packing. Um, and we didn't want to have two different systems, and so we wanted unifying abstraction, Spinnaker, um, and uh, we also were just spinning up our Barcelona office. The Collision Platform this year, we opened an office in Barcelona. We now have two teams working out of there, and um, we were okay with the things we had thrown together for templated cloud formation, and it was very easy to start a new service. We didn't terribly like it, though, and we would we want to take the opportunity since there are going to be more applications written by more teams without the benefit of three years of prior experience with our hack together stack on cloud formation that we wanted to give them a better experience than we had had um and uh so we uh we wanted we looked at spinnaker there are some other goals i put up on the slide here that we still haven't realized but we know are valuable 
like multi-account, multi-region, um, those for us, those were, we know those, those bonuses were more attainable. Um, we haven't, we still haven't done them. Um, so I shouldn't really call them out too broad, too much. Um, but our deploy um, now, uh, and actually it's not so different what we had before, um, and we'll go into more detail on this, is that like I think most people uh, who try to roll out Spinnaker across uh, you know, more than 10, 20 applications, uh, we made our own DSL for, uh, for pipelines because who's gonna create pipelines by hand, particularly if you have 20 services and they all look the same. Um, and uh, so it's, it's written in CoffeeScript, um, the DSL, you define everything in YAML. Um, and uh, so I guess it's not a CoffeeScript-based DSL, it's a, whatever, point being. CoffeeScript is the thing that transforms it into real pipelines. Um, and for every application, um, you get you will get two um, pipelines, one for preview, one for production, and a third one for applying CloudFormation changes, because we kept all of our infrastructure definitions of CloudFormation. Um, point being is that you were able to then we were then able to both uh, build out, I mean, define all the applications in uh, in Spinnaker uh, and all of their pipelines without any per application work, as well as when the time came, we were able to make ch just changes to the the uh, the script that would transform the YAML into pipeline configurations to give it uh, Kubernetes support. Um, and so this is actually extracted from an onboarding document we wrote from one of the new teams. Um, basically, this is the thing, the things you must do to have a new service at Scopely. Um, have to get our project, you've got to have, be able to call Scopely package, either using our Gradle plugin that we wrote, um, or having to find that task to do something that also pushes a even package to the appropriate place. You have to have a coffee formation file. Coffee formation we still use. It's our coffee. It's our coffee script DSL for cloud formation. That is open source and it's linked in the in the doc, and you can find it online. There, it's um, uh, and then uh, you need to define the Ansible playbook for making your service. Your Ansible playbooks for most of these say install the Debian package, um, and uh, your deployment specification, which is the YAML, and. When all this is done, a service deployed basically like this. Very boring. This is what this is a different diagram of Spinnaker. It's supposed to be boring. Services are supposed to be boring. Um, but basically, build an artifact, back an image, deploy it with Red Black, or actually frequently Highlander. Um, deploy it with a strategy. Um, well, the strategy of choice. I can. This will all be. You can. The deck will be online shortly. Um, so the pipelines, uh, this is my favorite part of it because I think looking at pipelines is fun. Um, hopefully you enjoy it as well. And so what this means is that every service basically looks like this. It has uh, some preview production deploys um, and uh, here you know, are the pipeline saying apply CloudFormation changes. Um, these uh, are basically using CloudFormation with its new uh, sort of plan apply uh, feature. Um, where you can say, uh, I want you to generate the change set for these, this. Uh, for this, if it's a non-MP change set, it will actually use the wait for human input um, feature of Spinnaker. And if you say yes, we've hooked this up so that it's just doing all the work on Jenkins. Um, uh, you hook this up so it actually goes and applies the change set. And so it, you know, that is the way. You, if there are CloudFormation changes, which are now rare um, in our application deployments, because um, our cloud formation for a service will frequently include SNS topics, SQS queues, IAM roles, maybe not even them usually, buckets, you know, any external infrastructure. Um, and so you can go, you know, hundreds of deploys without any changes to the stuff. Um, but it's uh, we kept it because that allowed us to actually keep um, in the things you need for an application. Uh, you still get to specify some infrastructure you need. You need something, you put it in there. Um, so that works pretty well. Um, I want to show you the, uh, the YAML. I, I, I'll state later that we are not actually planning on open source and the thing that converts this into pipelines, I think, largely because we think we should probably move off of it because we should probably try the declarative thing that's now official um, and it hopefully works better, although we haven't tried it yet. Maybe, maybe we won't. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess if we start, decide to stick with this, maybe we will open source it. Um, as an alternative in the world, just what we need. But basically, I want to call out that this is um, a, a description of how your service should deploy. 
Um, our services frequently have a couple of components, a web layer, worker layer, maybe a few different smaller components of itself that tend to get deployed all together. That's a pattern we frequently use, as you'll see in further um, pipelines. Um, and these are actually two different applications. But on the one on the left is deploying to uh, EC2. Actually, it no, it's the same application, two different. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's deploying to EC2. Um, and then we moved to deploy to, to Kubernetes. All we really had to do was change. We introduced the concept of deploy target. And uh, basically, that's the whole thing. Um, one small note, um, I guess it's sort of uh, is that we we ended up since we're deploying using Kubernetes on top of AWS, some of the things are maintained. We use Kube2 IAM to maintain our ability to have uh, service scoped um, IAM roles, and so they pick up uh, that. You know, uh, it doesn't say it on the right. Incidental, oh yeah, instance role at the top, yeah, Kraken service. Kraken service. And so that um, this particular service called Kraken, as you might imagine, um, it has a dedicated IAM role, and it's going to receive it from Kubernetes via kube 2 um, which if you look at this, this is the exact same thing, except that some things we're able to limit altogether on the Kubernetes target, like um, on Kubernetes, we're generating rough three entries, generating load balancers, um, and we don't have to have them there were these ones on the left. The some of the things like load balancers, security groups, as you know, they're not created by uh, directly by Spinnaker, and so they would be created by the by the confirmation that's paired with application, and then specified in the application deployment detail. Um, that's a we were able to get rid of that altogether when we moved to Kubernetes because Kubernetes would create them for the application um, with appropriate work. Um, uh, this is a just you know. You don't really, we don't, as I said, we're not planning on open source this at the moment because I don't think it's good for the community, even though it does a great job. Um, you know, basically, there's a whole bunch of copy script that builds out all of the pipelines necessary, all the application definitions, all of the information on what quick links you should have per instance um, for a given application uh, based on that fairly terse um, YAML, which is not intended to be fully expressive. The YAML is intended to be a really light definition of what a service looks like at Scopely. Um, it probably would be a bad match for general purpose, but didn't need to be. Um, uh, and so this is the way we were able to basically forklift all, all, all of our applications over from their uh, CloudFormation only deploys, where similarly, the steps for making a new service were just basically say, hey, there's a new service called Bob, um, and here's the repo. and everything was sufficiently um, convention driven that everything would work, that we were able to keep that and actually um, on a service by service basis make almost no changes in first moving to EC2 and then further forklifting to, uh, to Kubernetes. Um, and so that, that is uh, quite nice. And in fact, if we were to move to the declarative configuration, I think we'd, we would obviously have to look at how do we maintain the forkliftability. Um, hopefully we can. Um, uh, pipelines. So one of the reasons we were, um, one of the things we really wanted to do um, within uh, with moving to Spinnaker is make it so that it was easier to deploy things right. Um, this is a real deploy from just a couple days ago, seven days ago, of a part of our, event, uh, our data analytics system. Um, and uh, one of the things we do, we since we have a relatively small number of of customers, which is the, the games that work with us, um, and we intentionally so, um, we do a degree of quality service guarantees for different games and different sort of sets of games, so that you know a huge spike in usage of one has zero cannot impact other games. And so we actually deploy what we call affinities, which are basically semi-dedicated, uh, complete stacks of uh, of you know uh, for uh, for different sets of games. Um, and so that meant that means that when you do a deploy, you actually rather than deploying to all of our customer, deploying to all of our event pipelines at once, we actually rolled out to one and another one, another one, another one, um, which uh, pro possibly because we didn't invest enough in Jenkins tooling um, was kind of painful in Jenkins. Um, as you've seen, this, this is mainly is, you can't see the DAG lines on this very much, but I, I we're very. We're very happy to be able to finally wire it 
into the one master pipeline. <laughs> and so if you look at it, I mean, this is, it's very simple, nothing special about it, um, except that it does all of the work that previously was four steps um, all in one with appropriate appropriately logic pauses. And so it has actually a human, uh, a human check after the first affinity is deployed. Um, so after deployed to default, which is basically all the non-production games. Um, and then as we roll out further, it just sort of pushes them out, waits for them to settle, and it goes and it moves on. Well, this is actually deployed into Kubernetes, um, but um, because of the way that this is set up, we were able to fork the, this as well intact from each studio Kubernetes just, I think, about uh, two weeks ago, three, maybe two weeks ago. Um, and so one of our core goals were, was uh, to cut costs by bin packing all of these diverse uh, sort of game specific infrastructure, uh, game specific deployed copies of services, bin packing them better into uh, shared uh, nodes on Kubernetes, but also to let ourselves have complex deploy strategies without going crazy. Um, which we thought was important. Um, other notes on the platform side, um, we use uh, our existing auth broker for, uh, for, for OAuth. We're not using fiat, you know, um, which basically keeps the, the degree of uh, isolation of capabilities about to where it was with Jenkins, which has been fine so far. Um, we, uh, you know, we have a logging sidecar thing that I'm trying to convince the Armory people to do the work of open sourcing for us. Um, that um, collects all the logs from Spinnaker as well as from applications via a logging sidecar. Um, Kinesis, Lambda, Elasticsearch, Kinesis, Kibana, um, that hopefully will be open sourcing. Um, but um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, this, this, the original transition took three months. Um, uh, that was not three months of you know eight people working out 24 hours a day. It was one person occasionally. Um, and um, we really we succeeded in making you know it easy to deploy and understand applications, um, and as well as we succeeded in moving cleanly to Spinnaker and and actually moving on our own schedule because because we we were able to with just a small change in our YAML point an application at one or the other we were able to run something in, in, in Kubernetes move it off if we determined we had made a mistake. Um, and so on, and so on. And so we didn't have to, um, it wasn't painful to move at our own pace for that. Um, there, the only issues that we still encounter are primarily around Kubernetes um, and Spinnaker and Kubernetes support. Um, we're um, cautious optimistic about the uh, changes that are planned for the new Kubernetes provider. Um, and I, I think um, one of the things that a lot of people put in their slides is these, these showing how many deploys they've had. Our number of deploys has probably not gone up. Um, I, I never thought, I've never seen that as a goal to have more deploys. I think people are already deploying as much as they wanted to, at least in our situation they were. Um, I do want that to be easier to do things right and a fewer possibility for human error and have complex strategies when you want them, but um, like, they're simpler. Um, they already were done probably as much as appropriate for our services. Some of the services still deploy once a year or less because they're not being developed. And so I guess you don't deploy them as much. Um, but that's the platform side, games. So how are we doing on time? We have plenty of time, almost. And so I already said that what some of the motivations were for using Spinnaker in, uh, in game servers, um, we believe that we needed a good tool for blue green, um, and so. But here's the to set expectations. These slides on the, on the right are actually just extracted from the talk at reInvent three years ago about why we do blue green for game development. But that's what blue green looks like. Um, but there were a lot of things that were different. Um, Publisher platform was the easy one because we had 20 services that they all looked the same and all already had a completely standard deploy among them, um, and had a very you know ops hungry and familiar team working on it. Um, and games are very different. A lot of them are more monolithic. Um, a lot of them have uh, some of the studios have very little experience with AWS or not you know not, not as much as other teams did. Um, also, there have been you know, game development has, a, it's very, you know, there is automatic, uh, they're doing testing, there are, there are automatic tests. There's a lot of manual regression testing um, that, that game teams do. Um, and that's a part of the deployment process. 
is understanding the impact on undeployed games. Games are very stateful. A lot of state is on, you know, is, is hard to, is easy to piss people off and easy to break things, hard to fix. Um, and so um, this is also the area where, you know, we probably, you know, in terms of like where we end, we end up working with, with Armory on this and it was the area where we, we knew that we weren't, like my team certainly was not going to be providing Spinnaker guidance on a day in day out basis to game teams, like the game studios, we couldn't do that. We do it for ourselves, but not for, not for game teams. Um, we have uh, just not the, not the capacity for that. Um, but as I said, you know, we did, uh, we did have standards, um, and some games were using them. This, you know, Packer, the Fleet Commander approach I described already, using um, Packer to make armies, or their own thing we built, wrote to make armies before that, um, and, uh, and Club Formation, and some Python around that, to give ourselves the, the stage scale switch rollback patterns. That said, while we were able to wrap that in Jenkins steps, I mean, basically, this is in, every, in all the teams that were using these tools, this is what Slack would look like. They're like, okay, finally got it baked. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna stage it now. I'm gonna switch now. Oh, oh, I just looked and someone forgot to scale down the green group from last time. And like it, the steps, we probably could have done a better job with Jenkins tooling to use like a Jenkins pipeline around them, but we didn't. Um, one of our studios actually uh, had the great idea of numbering the steps in Jenkins because previously they weren't numbered and people would, do I do stage first, scale first, do I switch? And it's, you know, the steps were theoretically simple, but, you know, they were steps that had no thought behind them. Therefore, you shouldn't make people think about them. Um, and other studios also have other solutions. Um, our, before uh, our internal studio moved to, uh, moved to uh, the Fleet Commander, we were using um, Rake and Robocopy, it's a Windows service, um, uh, to deploy on uh, always running instances. That was fun. Um, but um, others, you know, we have teams using a, a variety of tools. Um, uh, but our, what we ended up going with for game servers is basically this. Um, this is in preview, what preview looks like, um, and uh, where there, there's a, a set of additional tests running that they run on a live on sort of a running cluster, um, in addition to the ones that run as part of a, a set of a, a integration tests that run prior to moving to the preview environment. So there's a pattern like this, um, which has worked pretty well for the team. Um, in uh, for the, several of the games, um, and I wanted to show you production, a production deploy, and what we're using right now. Um, and so we're not using automated canary analysis in production yet, um, uh, but we've been doing canaries for a long time, a couple of years now, um, in term in game development, and it really just usually meant spinning up a, a server um, in the fleet or maybe a couple. Um, the fleet is 100 servers, we spin up a couple, and we give ourselves a dedicated dashboard or log aggregation for those, and you let them run. <laughs> you let them run, um, and frequently be overnight. And so this this canary, and we we've kept that pattern. Um, and that's uh, that's a it's a manual canary, um, and it's we particularly find it valuable because of a, a number of things. One of them is the is that some of the the ways that the game servers are used can have can be very time dependent. I mean, we have load twenty four seven, but there might be things like live events, like tournaments starting and ending at different times, and it, you you need you want to have touched most of you want your application to have really run as discussed in the panel previously but also like there's a the other part that we care about is understanding whether there's any impact on clients um, and what we don't have a way of identifying which clients had requests served by the canary um, you know we look very closely at any potential regressions in the clients that we can identify in that time period and closely at the logs emitted by the instances that are being canaried. Um, the pattern beyond the potentially 19 hour canary um, is basically a fairly standard blue green rollout um, pipeline. Um, but you know, it's fully stated here for those of you who aren't actively using blue green rollouts. And, um, uh, but you know, for us, there are still challenges um, in terms of how rolling out to game studios. Um, the biggest ones are that 
there are so many assumptions, like so many things you must have already done to be able to even look at Spinnaker as a deploy, as a system for delivery. I mean, you you have to be you have to have something that can be delivered in, uh, with these uh, immutable images. Um, you have to. Um, you have to value that. Um, you have to see the value in that. There has to be value in that. Um, and uh, the development volume, uh, uh, volume. I think I, I think I mean velocity. Um, velocity is the word. Um, development velocity is what people are sensitive to, particularly in these dev environments. When we rolled out a, a pipeline like this, that hurts. That hurts because you frequently it's a lot of client server development, and so I want to get my change out. Like the, because the people working on the game client, we realize I just have a quick regression. I need a quick fix, and so um, we still need to find uh, better ways to maintain develop, development velocity so that people can get fixes out, um, so they're not blocking client developers. Um, and um, again, though, it's not uh, what we were hoping to get through Spinnaker's rollout is actually largely deploy quality. And so we're Canary, which the auto, potential automation around Canary is probably the most exciting thing that we hope to be the, the motivation for a broader adoption of Spinnaker across the rest of the studios, despite the cost of adopting Spinnaker, which is very high. If you haven't done your, if, if you're currently using OpsWorks, there's a lot you got to do before you're using Spinnaker. <laughs> um, and, um, and so having there be real value through an actual canary that can work for the game teams is something that we are bullish about um, because the velocity, again, it's not like we don't have a way of getting code on servers without Spinnaker. It's the question of like, are, do we, are we getting a better way of getting code on servers? Um, as we move to having more studios using this, um, uh, one of the questions we, so far we're not using uh, Spinnaker in a multi-tenant fashion. We're using different Spinnaker deployments for different studios. Um, part of that is because if we had a big centralized one, there would have to be the, the centralized team responsible for making sure it's good and healthy. Um, that said, you know, we're very, you know, there's something very tempting around saying, hey, all of the games to do is your, like, here's the way you deploy. You fill in, you do exactly what Spinnaker needs for you, and it will be all deployed to the centralized Spinnaker that will give, that will give us better um, visibility into the, the approaches each studio takes and an easier way to, um, to do that. Um, it's difficult, though, because um, sometimes it's difficult because there's not a central team to take that on at our company, um, and we're not sure we want one. And uh, it's not, I mean, Spinnaker can be multi-tenant, um, but I don't know if anyone's using it in ways where they don't want the tenants to know about each other at all. Maybe some people are, someone can tell me. Um, uh, we're also conscious of the fact that, you know, a lot of the most interesting deployment questions actually are around deploying client code. Um, and so there, we already take a very deliberate approach to using uh, Google Play has a concept of a stage rollout for, for APKs. And so our mobile client actually, um, we make very explicit decisions around when and how to roll it out to greater fractions of the user base. That is something that we, uh, that's philosophically aligned with Spinnaker, but we haven't actually crossed those in any way yet. Um, so that's our story. I don't have a questions uh, or thank you slide, but you can pretend there is one. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. So that, that like integration potentially looked like pulling in that Google Play API for like you know, a Spinnaker pipeline stage. I mean, you could. We could. Um, you know, I think that the value would pro the the problem with Google Play API is that you don't have good visibility into how much can you. It might make sense. Um, it might make sense. Um, it would probably only really make sense if we were sufficiently integrating client health metrics into tools that also work tightly integrated with Spinnaker. Because um, right now, I mean, Google's actively trying to make that client rollout system better. 
um, and I think has put a lot into it in the past year or so. Um, and we don't necessarily want to reinvent the wheel they just made. Maybe the Google team working at Spinnaker can, you know, connect those dots. It seems unlikely. Um, although, you know, it's there might be something there. Like there might be something there. Um, we don't know yet. Um, there are other things get deployed as well. Um, client assets is another thing. Um, so there's a lot of downloadable assets that we do have direct control over. Um, that right now they don't frequently don't have much of a deploy strategy. They just get pushed to cloud front. Have you heard of the uh, the new efforts to push pockets uh, basically by its I I know that's been mentioned. Um, there's some distribution stuff. Um, I I. Since you right now, the way we do ass, asset deploys is that the important part is actually configuration change, not the asset deploy itself. Assets are usually content addressed for us, and so they would never they're never overridden. Um, and so the important thing is actually pointing users to the asset, not actually deploying the asset to the CDN itself. And so it's really the configuration rollout that's uh, of more interest. Um, we are interested in um, how Spinnaker would make it easier to have better auditing and canary and understanding the impact of configuration changes. Um, but we haven't, uh, we're trying to work on the code deployment first um, and not everything first. But. This is not like specifically with Spinnaker. I'm curious, uh, that Kubernetes uh, using the IAM role thing in AWS? Yeah. Is that like a... Uh, Keep to IAM. It's, it's pretty widely used, I think, among people using Kubernetes on AWS. Um, I think we have... The problem, only issue with it is that it is somewhat less stable in our experience than the EC2 metadata service that you get on AWS. And yeah. so, and uh, losing IAM in the middle of a service running does not make services happy. Um, not surprisingly. Is it implemented uh, by like a controller? It is. Daemon set? Daemon oh, OK. Yeah, because I feel like, man, I would love that. Yes, I got my noun. I keep remembering all of the Kubernetes nouns is really hard. Um, OK. But uh, yeah, Daemon set. It runs on all the nodes? Yeah. OK. Um, but. In some ways, like the there are like two stories of transformation here. The big one for the publishing team was like Spinnaker was sort of a, a nice like icing on the cake for us. Um, Kubernetes that was enabled via moving to Spinnaker um, would have been a harder switch without Spinnaker in the mix because it would have been meant two very different worlds. We got to treat it as one. Um, that's one like that was I don't know, a very different transformation than what we're doing for the game teams. Do you deploy any stateful services? We, I mean, not not deeply stateful. And so the event collection pipeline, it's a collection pipeline. It does have, it's it's all stream process, largely stream processors, um, reading from Kinesis stream, sorry, the Kinesis stream, sorry, in S3, some in-memory work. Um, uh, but they, Nothing that we can't handle with with uh, stateful shutdown with uh, clean shutdowns, um, and they're not. And so we we do use uh, you know clean the, state, the clean shutdowns first on EC2 and then on Kubernetes to uh, make it an easier rollout so that things like checkpoint all their work and flush their any in memory things that have memory and then shut down on their own timeline, um, but uh, nothing very stateful. Spinnaker itself. Kind of stateful. Uh, so your your Redis. And yeah, and all, of, all of we take a, an aggressive have other people do it strategy um, without a dedicated infrastructure operations team um, at all. Uh, our Redis is all Redis Labs. Um, our state is all DynamoDB or RDS or something, depending on the depending on what it is. Except for got that Cloudera cluster. Well, Big nodes, but we, we don't deploy that one spinnaker at the moment. Uh, at the moment, yeah, we probably won't. We, I, 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 I don't think someone, the person from Optimizely, was talking about their 
they not with Spinnaker, but they, they are doing some more aggressive things around uh, Cloudera cluster deployment strategies than I expected to hear. Immutable instances, not, well, not immutable, obviously, but data on them, but using basically army baking and not sort of, sort of a, not, a, yeah. It sounded pretty good. But. There's a person here from Optimizely who talked about that, but obviously not in this room. Um, not, not it wasn't a talk. He talked about it sitting next to me. Um, we talked about it. <laughs> I have shared our private conversation. Uh, great. Well, it looks like we have more questions. So, if there's anything, describe me.